For the love of one of the most misquoted verses in all of the Bible. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Now jump over if you would. Verse 17. Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. Now, there are some things in life whose value you can really only determine by the way that they're used. Let me give you an example of that. Back in November 1998, medical authorities at Miami, uh, in Miami reported that 29-year-old uh, Amy Johnson actually died as a result of water intoxication. The coroner's report actually stated that she had consumed an excess of of water. Apparently, at some point in the day prior to her death, she had consumed over four gallons of water, three and a half times the daily recommended amount. And um, something really investigators discovered had become routine for her, and she had literally poisoned herself to death uh, as a result of too much water. Now, when we think of water, we realize that's one of the basic necessities of life, and we realize how important and how valuable water really is to the sustenance of life. And yet when used in the wrong way, something that really is valuable can become something really, really very abusive and very um, bad for us. And so there's a lot of things like that in life that their value can really only be determined by the, by the way that they're used. Well, the truth of the matter is that that's also true for money. Money is neither bad nor good. It's really neither positive nor negative. Its value is really determined by how you actually use it. And Paul actually teaches us that very lesson, that very truth in the, in the scripture that we're looking at this morning when he begins to talk about this thing of money and riches and things and so on. Now, again, we're in this group of messages that we're calling Extreme Makeover Home Edition. And we've been working our way through these various rooms that we've kind of said needed to be uh, either done away with completely or a completely new makeover. And so we've walked through certain rooms and we talked about bringing in a new boss. We got sort of in the family room, you know, to start out. And we said the, the, this particular room just needed to, uh, to, you know, maybe it was just be done away with completely. And just kind of like the show, you know, come in and just tear the whole thing down. And so... We kind of walked through that family room. We talked about communication and the importance of communication and how valuable that is and how important that is to every marriage and every family. Uh, we, we took a couple of weeks to walk through the kids' room. It took us a little while to get through there. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why, because we were talking about parenting. And we looked at that famous verse, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he'll not depart from it. And we said, there's, it's just chock full of truth. So we looked at all kinds of things rela related to parenting. And we concluded last week with this issue of discipline, the purpose of discipline, uh, the process of discipline, and all of those kind of things. And so I would encourage you, parents, if you missed it, pick the uh, go to the website, listen to that, and learn some about discipline. Uh, I was not one who was like sort of the, the Spock mentality who said, don't spank. I was a, I'm in favor of spanking. And so uh, find out what I said about that last week, and I encourage you to listen to that. Well, this week, though, we're talking about this thing of finances, and Paul is talking about uh, this thing of, of the dollars and money and things and riches and so on. And what is our perspective to be towards that, and how does that work for us and to our benefit in a home and in our families? And so this morning, what we want to do is we want to talk about keeping your family financially fit. And I want us to look at three principles that really helps us do just that. And these are general principles, but they ought to be things that we all think about, we all apply when talking about this thing of money and dollars in our home. So what are those principles that he teaches us in the scripture today? Well, the first one is this. The first principle is attack the more monster. If you want to keep your family financially fit, and I would encourage you to think about this particularly if you're younger. If you want to keep your family financially fit, first, attack the more monster. You see, everybody always wants more. 
Everybody always wants more. And it seems like it just doesn't ever, ever stop in our lives. If your first house is a two-bedroom, two-bath house, before long, guess what you want? You want a second house with three bedrooms and three baths. And if you got a Honda the first time, won't be long before you want a Land Cruiser, you want a Lexus. And if you got a tent the first time, won't be long before you want a pool camper. And if you got a pool camper the first time, won't be long before you want a fifth wheel. And if you get a fifth wheel, you know, you want a condo at the beach or whatever the case may be. Because human nature is always hunting for more. And I want you to know that no family will ever be able to be strong and financially fit and honor God with their finances until they attack the more monster. And they deal with that deadly, debilitating disease, and they just put it to, get, uh, to death. You've got to kill the more monster. Now, how do we deal with that craving? How do we deal with that thing that so drives so many of us in our lives, whether it be individually or in our homes? How do we, how do we attack that problem? Well, Paul tells us right here in verses 6 and 8. He uses a word two times. And that word is extremely important. It's not popular. But it's extremely important. Guess what that word is? It's the word contentment. Now, I noticed not too many people said amen to that. And the reason is because we don't like that word contentment. And the reason we don't care much for that word contentment is because it really counters that whole issue that goes on inside of us related to this thing of always wanting more. What does the word contentment mean? Well, a lot of times we think the word contentment's bad because we start thinking about contentment insofar as looking at people like they're lazy or something. In other words, we start thinking that it must be some good for nothing nobody, you know, who just doesn't want to have any kind of, they don't have any kind of personal drive, they don't have any kind of ambition in life, they don't have any kind of motivation, anything like that. And so we think, well, that's a person who is content. Just somebody doesn't have any kind of personal drive about them. They're always kind of lazy, always doing nothing. But that's not what contentment is. The word contentment actually comes from a word that means containment. That, that's literally what it comes from. It simply means to be self-contained. It means to be self-mastered. It's the idea of finding all that you need to be happy and to be fulfilled inside of you, internally, inside of you, in Christ. That's literally what it means. In other words, I don't have to have anything else outside of what's inside of me to be happy or to be uh, satisfied or to be uh, content. That's really what it means. You find your fulfillment in your relationship with Christ. And that's why Paul said on one occasion over there in the book of Philippians chapter 4, he said, not that I speak from want. He said, it's not that I want something. He said, because I've learned in whatever state that I am, I am content. And what's interesting is that Paul, at that particular occasion, was writing at a time when he was in a place called the Mamertine Prison, or the Mamertine Dungeon, which was in Rome, which was one of the, the dreariest, darkest places to ever be. And he was locked to guards all day long. They rotated every four hours. And, I mean, he was chained to them, and, um, and he was isolated from other people. And, I mean, so here he was. Here was a guy who was, was essentially isolated and alone and and, and persecuted for his faith in Christ. And yet he said, no matter where I am, I've learned to be content. If I've got a lot, I'm content. If I don't have anything, I'm content. He learned the secret of being content. And that's the difference. And that's the, the big uh, uh, kicker for all of us. And that's really why Paul even went so far as to say later on in the book of Galatians. He said, he said, for I've been crucified with Christ. And it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And he even talked about Christ who is our life. That simply means that all of the things that really matter most in life, all of the things that really make life livable can be found in Christ. It's all of our real needs. The things that we really need in life can be found in him. And when you and I begin to get that, and we really understand that, and that really begins to sink in, that all we really need, our real needs can be met in Christ, all of a sudden it hits you one day that there really are very few things that you really need anymore. Because all the things you really need, you already have in Christ. 
peace, joy, happiness, love, forgiveness, mercy, and on and on the list goes. Those things you already have, and those are the things that matter most in life. That's what you and I really need. Yes, we need clothes. Yes, we need food. And yes, we need water. But outside of that, the real needs are already in Christ. And so when you and I begin to get that, when contentment becomes the banner under which you and I live, we will stop being driven by the desires for more, more things, more stuff, and we'll start operating on the basis of our needs in life, not our wants. And so many of us operate on the basis of what we want in life and not what we need in life. Now, Lot wanted a little bit more, and he settled in Sodom. Jacob wanted a little bit more, and he cheated on his own brother. David wanted a little bit more, and he, he, he got Bathsheba, and he lost his entire family. The religious establishment wanted a little bit more in Jesus today. And they ended up crucifying and, and, and trading a sinner for a savior. Because they just wanted a little bit more. And we replay that scene in our lives over and over again every single day of life. Because we think more is better and more will buy peace, and more will buy happiness, and more will buy joy, and more will buy uh, a, a better life, when in reality, I'm telling you, it will always leave you with less, even though you got more. And so if you want to stay financially fit, and you want to honor God with your finances in your home, first and foremost, you've got to attack the more monster. Let me tell you something. Keep the Toyota from the 70s. Fix up that old house instead of buying a big old brand new honking new one. Turn your boat in for a bucket and sit on the side of the shore. You can catch fish there just as much as you can in the boat. Stop the more monster. Stop chasing the wind. Because Paul says great gain has nothing to do with what you and I hold in our hands. But rather it has everything to do with who holds you and me in our hearts. We bought nothing into this world. And Paul said, we're not going to take anything out of this world. There are no moving vans behind hearses. Naked you came into this world, you're going to go out stark naked. And so stop making things the priority of your life. Stop making stuff that's on the outside of you what you have to have in life. No, realize that if you really want to attack the more monster... You've got to be content inside, and that has to do with being self-contained, self-mastered, realizing that all of your fulfillment of all of your needs comes in Christ who lives in you. Attack the more monster. Godliness is a means of great gain when it is accompanied by contentment. Let me give you a second principle. And the second principle is this. Attack the more monster, but if you want to keep your family financially fit, counter the credit culture. All right, let me hear that. Amen or oh me? Yeah. All right, attack the more monster and then counter the credit culture. Now listen to what Paul instructed us to, and, and Timothy in verse 17. He said, instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited, or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God. Now, did you see the contrast? You see what he said? He said, don't fix your hope on the uncertainty of riches, but do fix your hope on what? On God. In other words, if you're rich with the world's goods, and by the way, ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you something. If you're an American, you're rich. If you live in this country, you're rich. All you got to do is just, just fly around a few places in this world, and you'll find out how wealthy, how rich, how spoiled, rotten we really are in this country. There's not either one of us that's sitting in this building this morning as an American that's not rich. But here's what he says. He says, if you're rich with the world's goods then don't depend on your riches as your source of supply. Don't depend on your riches or the things of this world as your place of sufficiency. But put your hope, 
put your confidence and your dependence on the Lord himself. Now, how does that differ from what the world tells us when it comes to things? How's that different? Well, the world doesn't say to you and me, well, just trust the Lord. When you walk into the banker's desk and sit down, he doesn't say, well, look, I believe you just trust the Lord. It'll all be good. No, that's not the way it works. What the world says is, ah, you don't have it? Whew. Well, no problem. We'll give it to you. It's yours. We'll take care of you. Don't worry about it. In fact, just, just on Friday and Saturday of this week, I counted between, between Watson and us, I think we had about four or five credit card offers. We had uh, two student loan offer, offers. And all of that was just because they loved us. They just want to give it to us. They just wanted us to have what they have. And here's what's so sad is that so many people in this world believe that. So many people in this country believe that. Do, do you realize our consumer debt proves how ridiculous this concept is? Do you know in 1999, our consumer debt... Now, consumer debt is things like car loans, student loans. It's not mortgages. Mortgages is different. Revolving credit, credit cards that are revolving. So consumer debt in this country in 1999, $1.5 trillion. Guess what it is now? Now, consumer debt, not mortgages. 3.62 trillion dollars. Car loans, student loans, revolving credit cards. 1.4 trillion of that consumer debt was just credit card debt. Which, by the way, is growing twice as fast as wages are in this country. Now, that'll bless your heart. So we paid over $100 billion in just credit card interest last year. And several years ago, I heard that the average family has three credit cards with at least 6800 on every card. And the average pa family pays almost $1,300, $1,292 of interest a year just on credit cards. Just on one credit card. I mean, can you believe that? And that's the, way, that's the way the world is. That's what the world says to us. They say that's the answer. That's the world say, that, that's the, what they say. That's the way you handle it. Just get your credit card. Just get your line of credit. Buy now. Pay later. Enjoy it. Live it up. We live in a credit culture, borrow-minded society. And the only problem with that is that that's the kind of thinking that will cloud your mind. And before long, you're not looking to the Lord for your supply. You're not trusting Jesus. You're not trusting God in any way. No, you are looking to the lenders and to the mortgage companies and to the banks to keep you alive. And that's the problem with credit. If you're not careful, it'll take your eyes off of God and you'll begin to put your hope in MasterCard and you'll begin to put your hope in Visa and everybody else and you will become a slave to those who are called creditors. That's what Proverbs said. Proverbs chapter 22 verse 7 says, The rich rules over the poor and the borrower becomes the lender's slave. And let me tell you, if you don't believe that, you just try to get rid of everything. You just try God to call you to go around to some other country to be a missionary somewhere and see what you've got to do when you take off. See what happens when you try to leave town and you don't pay some of those bills, some of those things you got in your life. I want to tell you something. If you don't realize you are a slave to the lenders, just try to go somewhere. They'll find you. Now, before you crucify me, and I can feel it, I can feel it already. Before you crucify me, let me say to you, let me make it clear. The problem is not credit. 
You can use credit to your advantage if you use it and not let it use you. The problem is not borrowing. The problem is living life beyond your means. The problem is not being able to pay back what you owe without tripling what you got out. Now let me show you how you can depend on the Lord and you can borrow only if you need to. Three principles. Number one, look at your economic return. Look at your, consider your economic return. In other words, anytime you borrow money, the thing that that money is borrowed to buy ought to either grow in value or pay an economic return greater than what you paid for it to borrow, what it costed you to borrow. Now, this is the problem with credit cards. The average rate of interest on a credit card today is about 19%. And in the Bible, that's called usury. That's an abuse. That's a system that's out of control. But if you're crazy enough to pay it, so be it. It's out there. Well, if you and I are putting depreciable items on our credit cards, like food and groceries and vacations and TVs and furniture and all of that kind of stuff, and you're not paying that off every single month, then the minute you walk out of the store or off the lot, you dug a hole for yourself in terms of your economic return. And it ends up costing you more to borrow for what you got than what you already actually got out of it. You got to consider your economic return and evaluate what are you using it for. If you're doing that, it's probably because you're living beyond your means. If you're not paying it off every single month and using credit instead of credit using you. The second thing is limit what you borrow to what you know you can pay back if the world should crash today. If your world should fall apart today, you lose your job, your health goes. Could you, in some sort of situation like that scenario, where you have all of this debt, could you pull from somewhere to pay all of that off so that you would not crumble and die under debt? Limit what you can borrow, or limit what you, you borrow to what you know you can pay back. One of the biblical principles about debt is that debt always presumes upon the future. So the way that you and I as Christians keep from violating that truth is making sure that we have a guaranteed way to repay. For instance, take this thing of credit cards. If you've got more month than you've got money to pay for what you've got on the card, and you know that if everything fell out from under you today, there'd be no way that you could pay that card off, then you are living above your means. And you're presuming upon tomorrow that you may or may not even have. Now, I understand about houses, and I understand about mortgages, and the cost, and so on. And most of us will have to borrow to buy a house, and so on. I understand. But your house becomes your collateral. And nine times out of ten, it is an appreciable asset. Which simply means that it's not depreciating, and it's adding money to your bank, not taking away from it, ultimately. And so... When you talk about this thing of using credit and countering the credit culture, don't allow it to dictate or dominate or crush you under its weight and for you to become a slave. No, instead, you take charge of it. You take control of it. How do you do that? Because the problem is not credit. The problem is not borrowing. It's when we live beyond our means and we don't use it effectively. So what I want to suggest to you is that you consider these things. Consider the economic return. Consider the fact that you can pay off 
what you have around you if the worst case scenario should happen. And then third, learn to turn to God and not the lenders first for your provision. Turn to God first, not the lenders. You see, you can go to a lender and you can borrow the money at the drop of a hat. And most of us do that so flippantly that we never even check with God about the things that we buy anymore. You've heard me say this all the time. I've said it many times. I say, you know, you need a new refrigerator. What do you do? Because you got a credit card. You know what you do? You go up there and you get your new refrigerator. You just put it on a credit card. Now, are you going to pay that off at the end of the month? Fine. That's the way to do it. But if not, you just lost. That's the problem. Is that maybe God wanted to do something greater. Maybe God wanted to give you one. Maybe God had been working in somebody else's life that, that if they knew you had that need, he would inspire them or move them to provide that for you. We never give God a chance because of the credit culture that we live in. And we have become inundated and we have become saturated with that mindset so much so that we hardly ever even live by faith anymore. We live by the credit card. And so listen to what I'm saying to you this morning. I know it's not easy. And I know how many of us, including us, we've all been there and we've all done that. But I'm telling you, it'll rip your home apart. If you don't believe that, just look at the statistics. 60% of our homes that end in divorce today, guess why they did? Because of money. Money. I can't tell you how many times I've sat in the pastor's office in the counselor's office sitting there with folks just watching them cry watching them devastated because they were so deep into debt and couldn't do nothing and finally one of the other of them who disagreed with it so much finally said I'm out I've had it I can't go down into the hole anymore and so I'm trying to give you some principles from the Bible that'll help you in terms of keeping your family financially fit from a Christian perspective number one Attack the more monster. Learn to be content with what you have in Christ. And if you seek him first in the kingdom of God, guess what? He's going to add. That's what he said. He's going to add all these other things to you. To make sure you have what you need, not necessarily what you want. Attack the more monster. Counter the credit culture. And then third, be a go-giver. Not a go-getter in life. See, part of the reason that so many of us are in the mess that we're in is because we're not givers. You know why? Because we're so deep in debt. And so we feel like we can't give anything. We feel like we can't give anything to God. Why? Because we don't have anything. Why? Because we're in debt. That's all the more reason. Where do you start? I just told uh, Watson about this the other night, you know. I was sitting there and we were having this family discussion and I said when you start out in life if you're if you're starting out as a young married couple or whatever it is you start out there's a couple of things you start off the bat off the top and one of those things is when you start trying to figure out about your finances off the top you take into account first what you give to God first and then you go from there but that's first and so one of the reasons that we struggle so much is because we don't feel like we can give because we're go-getting so much. Now look at verse 18 and 19. Paul said, tell the folks there in the church at Ephesus that if they want to be rich, tell them to be rich how? In giving and in sharing. Tell them to be rich in good works and giving and in sharing. See, that's the creative plan of God for our lives. We are to be go-givers, not go-getters. You can't rob God and rob others and think God's going to bless your socks off like a wild man. Given is the plan of God for this whole world. The whole economy of God is built upon the framework of this one thing, and it's called giving. And let me tell you, we throw a cog in that. We get the whole thing messed up when, when, when all we want to do is to be a go-getter and not a go-giver. Everything in the economy of God is a giver. Trees give fruit. The sun gives light. Seeds give life. Plants give oxygen. 
people like you and me ought to give. We're to be givers. That's the economy of God. We ought to bless others. And you start with a, with a tithe, the 10% of your income, and, and you share your time, and you share your resources, and you share yourself. You're a giver. You're not a getter. You're a giver. Everything is to give. That's the way God has built all things. And when we fail to do that, everything else right on down the line is affected. But when we do that, the law of return comes back. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. The law of return comes back to us, to our homes, to our families. And what you put in comes back again. And it's multiplied. So guess what you can do? You can give more. That's the law of return. That's the law of the harvest. That, that, that's the way God's designed the economy of this earth. Most of us don't have getting problems. Most of us have giving problems. Because we hold on to what we have too tight. Or because we're in so much debt, we don't feel like we can do anything. Corey Tim Boom used to say, I've learned to hold the dearest things to me in life most loosely in my hands. That way it doesn't hurt so bad when God starts prying them from my fingers. And ladies and gentlemen, that's the way we ought to hold our money. We ought to hold it loosely enough that we can regularly let it go. And you know what the Bible says? When you and I begin to do that in our lives and in our homes, God begins to return to us in multiplied fashion, what we have invested in his kingdom and in other people. And that's what Paul was talking about in verse 19. He said, you can't take a single stitch of what you and I got with us. You can't do it. Solomon said, you came naked, you're going to leave naked. But I want to tell you, you can send it ahead of you. There, there is a way to prepare for the future. You can send it on ahead of you. You can build for yourself what the Bible says, treasures in heaven. And you do that by investing in the kingdom, by investing in people, by giving to people. And so you see, this is how you can keep your family financially fit. Honor God with your finances. Attack the more monster. Counter the credit culture. And then be a go-giver, not a go-getter. And you manage your money. To the glory of God. I've discovered that those who manage what they, what they have well. Usually tend to be under management well in their lives. And so maybe today. What really needs to be surrendered. Is not so much your finances. As it is you. And me. Maybe what we need to surrender to God first, I, because I remember what the Bible says when, it, when Paul was describing the Macedonians and the gift that they were giving. And he said an incredible thing about them. He said what they did first before they gave of that gift to the Corinthians and to others, he said first they gave of themselves. Before, a man, uh, before God can ever have a man's money, he has to have the man himself. And so maybe the deal, maybe the issue is not money. It's our own hearts. And if God gets the heart, he gets everything we got. And so that's my encouragement to you today. And that is to realize you don't have to be bound by the dollars. You don't have to be living under this your whole life. You don't have to be subject to what our world tells us is the way to live. You can make a choice to live differently. You can have the kind of freedom and peace and deliverance from that kind of stuff. And you can be free to move and go and do as God calls. If God were to call you today, are you free enough to say, yes, I'll get up and go? Could you do it? Probably not for most of us. And the reason is because we're bound. We have become the lender's slave. And it simply makes, it simply takes a choice, a, a decision. It just simply takes you and me making a decision to say we're going to reverse the curse, we're going to go a different direction, and we're going to live life free of the lender. And it can be done. You just have to choose to do it. And let me tell you something. You, you will find out, you will discover 
the joy and the freedom and the value of knowing a relationship with God and depending on the Lord in a way that you've never known before when you make that choice. Keep your family financially fit and honor God. Manage the things that he's given you well. Let's stand for prayer. No one looking around. Every eye closed. Father God, you know every one of us. You know the things that, that are about us, the good things, and you know the bad things. And God, none of us here are, are, are perfect, including us and, and my family. I mean, we've battled and gone through those same things. And Lord, um, I just pray that we'd all understand together and learn together how to, how to best serve you and how best to honor you with the things that we have. God, there's no judgment here. Nobody's casting stones. Nobody's, I, I'm certainly not qualified. God, we, we just together learn to be all that you've called us to be. And so I pray, God, that even today, maybe there's one or two who would say, yeah, you know what? I want to be financially free. But more than that, not just because I want to be financially free, I want to be free because I want to be able to serve God. I want to be able to serve you. So, God, it is my prayer. However you want to set us free, however you want to bring deliverance to all of our lives, and whoever may find that to be a need today, I pray, God, that you'll do that and that we'll be committed to the task that you'll find us faithful in the end. Lord, we love you and we thank you for the way that you've spoken to us. And I pray that it'll challenge us and make us think more about depending, trusting you in life in all things. Lord, we love you. And if there's somebody even in this house today that, has, that maybe has nothing to do with what we've said today, but man, they just want to trust you and accept you as their Savior. I pray that you'll convict and convince of sin and call them to a relationship with you. We pray whatever the need is, God, There'll be a, a courage and a willingness to respond. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to sing.